So hello to everyone out there in the beyond. Uh, this is Sunday, May 10th, 2020, and happy Mother's Day, uh, most poignantly to my mother, but also word to everyone's mother out there. Um, what is an electronic nervous system for, but to get in contact with your mother. So everybody remember to do that today. Um, <laughs> because without them, none of this would be possible. Uh, so we're back once again with the Expanded Cinema Book Club on Gray Area's Patch. We are delighted to see once again, Gene Youngblood for today's se section on television as a creative medium. Um, it's a pretty large and dense section. Um, so we're also grateful to have joining us, Dr. Tina Ryan from the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo, New York. Uh, she is a curator, historian, critic, and educator specializing in art since the 1960s. Her work focuses on the uses of new media technologies, and she holds five degrees in art history, including a BA from Harvard and PhD from Columbia, um, and has curatorial credit at institutions like the Met, MoMA PS1, the New Museum, and ICA Boston. Um, and her Current book project, McLuhan's Bulbs, Light Art and the Dawn of New Media, examines the use of light art in the 1960s as a fulcrum between the discourses of medium and media in post-war art. And so thank you, Tina, for being here. Um, and so I guess without further ado, we can start some discussion of television as a creative medium. Great. Uh Thank you, Barry, for the uh, the introduction. I wasn't aware you were going to read all of that uh, from my website. I had to cut it down. That was a <laughs> people. That was a synopsis. Yeah, well, um, uh, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for the invitation to be here and talk to Jean, who you know, as Jean now knows, is one of my heroes. <laughs> um, so I uh, wanted to start this conversation about this chapter, TV as a creative medium, by. Um, explaining a little bit more, giving some historical context about video art in the 1960s um, and the role that this material that Jean talks about in this chapter plays in, in our histories of video art today. So um, the first thing I wanted to do is actually go back to the exhibition TV as a creative medium. So I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Let's see if this works. So if I've done this correctly, then you should see on your screen this PDF um, of the brochure of TV as a creative medium, which was an exhibition. Yeah, we see that, it. Perfect. Thank you, Barry. Um, that was hosted in 1969 by the Howard Wise Gallery in New York City. Um, the Howard Wise Gallery was a gallery uh, on West 57th Street and sort of what was then the Chelsea of the time. Um, and Howard Wise a really interesting character. Um, I've done research on him in the past and he basically, uh, I don't want to say was single-handedly responsible, but was very much responsible for bringing um, kinetic art and uh, video art and computer-generated art to the attention of New York um, uh, art audiences. So TV as a creative medium is often credited as being basically the first exhibition of um, television art or video art in a gallery context. And I'm just gonna scroll you through here because um, I love archival documentation. Um, and just to show you on the right here, a list of some of the artists who were represented in that relatively small show. And so some of these appear in Jean's book in this chapter, um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but I just want to point out the variety of the uses of television in this exhibition because it's actually something that's mirrored in Jean's book that um, we see people who are making sculptures, inert sculptures with television sets. We see people who are making interactive, um, quote unquote, cybernetic television environments using closed circuit TV. We see people who are, um, well, specifically here, Nam Jim Paik and Charlotte Mormon, who are doing um, television based performances. So TV is, is really, um, I mean, it's multiple technologies, but there's also multiple applications in terms of the kinds of um, manifestations uh, that it can take in an art context. So, um, and I think Jean, in your book, I mean, these, this variety is sort of reflected in your subheadings. You call them um, synesthetic videotapes, videographic cinema, and then closed circuit television and teledynamic environments. And we don't necessarily continue to use all of that language, but 
Um, but we, we do look at these different kinds of practices. Um, I also wanted to call out TV as a creative medium because um, of the history that Howard Wise would go on to play in the history of video art. So this exhibition happens in 1969. Howard Wise gets incredibly excited by the potential of video. Um, he starts thinking about art that exists beyond the confines of a physical gallery space and also beyond the discourse of the contemporary art world. And so in December 1970, he actually closes his gallery and then the following year founds a group um, or a nonprofit called Electronic Arts Intermix or EAI. And I'm imagining that if a lot of you are attending or watching um, this video, you, you may know what EAI is, but essentially they're based in New York, they continue to exist. Um, I'm not sure um, if Rebecca Kleeman, who is their newly anointed um, executive director, is in attendance yet, but um, you know, they're a fantastic institution devoted to the, um, the conservation, the distribution, and originally, and I think still today, the production of video art. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to do a shout out, if you can see here on the screen, that if you go to EAI's website, they have amazing documentation of this exhibition with short video clips that you can watch about some of these different um, or um, for short video clips from some of the different works that were in the exhibition. Um, to bring it back to Jean's book now, um, I just want to emphasize how important the story is that Jean was telling to the larger history of video art. When I was an undergraduate um, studying essentially 20th century art and experimental film, the story of video art that we were told, I mean, the protagonists were typically people like Bruce Nauman and John Baldessari and William Wegman, people who came out of the trajectory of, of post-minimalism and conceptual art, who typically were making single channel, black and white, sort of unedited uh, videotapes in their studio, um, essentially to document performances that they were doing. Very, very different in tone, um, in technology and process, in aesthetics, from the works that Jean talks about in his book, right, which are, colorful and psychedelic and deal with signal processing and use analog synthesizers and um, just a very, very different aesthetic and also come out of a different, um, a different place, right? Instead of being produced um, alone in the studio, a lot of these were so experimental with the technology that they had to be produced, as Gene recounts, um, within the context of a professional television studio, places like WGBH in Boston. Um, so, when I was first learning the history of video art, I think, um, like a lot of people, that wasn't the first story that I learned, the story that Jean tells. Um, and I actually went back and looked um, through my inbox and apparently I bought my copy of Expanded Cinema in 2004. I bought a pristine first edition um, for like nothing. And I think that watching what has happened to that book over the past 15 years, where it suddenly was going you know, for insane amounts of money, um, online and now has in fact been reissued just speaks to the fact that the history that Jean tells that part of the story of video art has become increasingly relevant to a younger generation of curators and art historians and artists. Um, so as the as sort of final part of um, this, my introductory remarks here, I wanted to actually show people um, an example of the kind of work that Jean talks about in this chapter because I think that you know, unless you have had an education in the history of video art, uh, you may not necessarily be able to picture what some of this stuff is like. And as I've said to Jean, I mean, he has an incredible facility as a writer with describing time-based media art, um, but even so, um, it's hard to, to picture some of this stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, show you actually a clip of work by Aldo Tambellini. So Aldo Tambellini is an artist who was in Howard Wise's TV as a Creative Medium exhibition and also um, was interviewed by Jean and appears in this chapter. And Jean actually mentions these two works, Black Video 1 and Black Video 2, and I have short samples of them to share with you now, thanks to the generosity of Aldo and his partner Anna Salamone and Wendy Payne, who's the executive director of the Aldo Tambellini Art Foundation, so many thanks to them. Um, so as Jean mentions, these are video constructions. Um, that's what Aldo called them at the time. And he called them that because unlike other videos um, that other artists were making, the content here, the image is not derived from something that was shot with a camera, 
nor is it derived from picking up a broadcast signal, right? So these are completely um, generated just through the circuitry of the televisual apparatus itself. And he actually made custom electronic circuitry to do this. So um, I think that this kind of work looks incredibly relevant to the history of video art. If you think about video art today and how it's been produced for the past 20 years using digital tools, I'm sorry, using digital tools, um, because it looks a lot like the kind of abstract computer generated digital animations that has been a huge area of research. So um, let's see if I can, and the sound on this is gonna be painful, but that's a feature, not a bug. So that's black video one and then black video two is a little more chaotic. So I'll show you that next and just again, a very short sample. And I just want to emphasize how truly radical um, this would have So, um, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm just really struck by how fresh this always looks. I mean, I feel like industrial music out of the 80s and 90s really owed a lot to this, um, which we're still um, with today. But, um, I, sorry, I'm just trying to get out of this, that video there. Um, I wanted to use this um, video as a, launching off point for a conversation with Jean and, and hopefully with the audience as well, um, just so we have a sort of concrete reference point um, for all of us that when we talk about expanded cinema and we talk about expanded cinema as it relates to the history of video art, you know, you can see some of the major um, ideas I think encapsulated in this video. So the question of metamorphosis, which is something that Scott Bartlett puts on the table, which Jean then picked up on, um, the, the way in which um, the signals of video were understood to, to lend themselves towards a continual process of transformation that was very different from the discrete cells of an analog um, of, a, a, of um, a film. So um, my question that I want to start with um, moving out of this work um, has to do with politics because I know that politics is something that interests Gene very much and he's spoken throughout this book club about how um, you know, his grand project um, has been a political economic critique of mass communication. And um, as somebody who loves this material very much, the material that's discussed in expanded cinema, but also is very interested in a political critique of mass communication and also in a kind of general leftist politics, abstraction has always posed a bit of a puzzle. Right? Um, when we look at the history of video art, it's very easy to point to certain practices as being explicitly political. We look at the work of TV TV or the video freaks or these other video commune groups who are you know, telling stories that they thought deserved to be told but were being ignored by broadcast media using the documentary format. You know, they're doing guerrilla television. They're, it's just more political in a way that we might recognize as being activist. Um, but I think that work like Aldo's is political too. And I think 
you know, if you look at what's discussed in expanded cinema, most of the works that Jean talks about are abstract. And the ones that feature bodies or are in any way figurative, they really radically distort the body through color and form. So even the, even the ones that are figurative also are about a process of abstracting the body. So um, my question to Jean basically has to do with how do we think about the politics of abstract video art? And I know for me, the way that I have, have worked through this problem in my own career is to really focus on the way in which abstract video um, is about creating new worlds, is about expanding the sensorium, um, is about taking technologies and redirecting them from their mainstream and commercial uses. But all of those answers depend upon a countercultural frame of mind, right? They depend upon um, basically the ethos of the 60s. And as somebody who didn't live through the 60s and didn't live through the 70s, I've always been curious what it felt like to then, you know, get to the 70s and to see that momentum stop, um, to see that sort of dream get deferred. <laughs> um, and how, Gene, that might have changed your understanding of this material or the politics of this material or how we can think about the politics of abstraction in the wake of um, psychedelia becoming more of a historical rather than a contemporary movement. Although now that I've said that, I even wonder um, if it is as historical. Maybe we need to to understand the politics of this movement by understanding that in fact psychedelia is something that is still with us and still a powerful force. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and hand it over to Gene now in case he has any thoughts about any of that. Oh boy, that's big. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, well, just to start on a very personal note, you know, I was literally at the center of, of, of counterculture being uh, associate editor and columnist for the free press, you know, which was the first and most influential of those of that phenomenon, underground press. And it was extremely powerful in terms of its cultural agency. <clears throat> and it was intense every single day for a long time. And then uh, around 1970, it seemed to kind of dissolve in some way. But I was sort of not noticing because right at that time, I got hired to teach at California Institute of the Arts, a whole new world for me. And I just dived into it. And I happened to have some of these videos. I, I may have been, no, I shouldn't say that. I was among the very few uh, professors, if you will, who had the actual material and could show students. Mm -hmm. I don't even, maybe I had enough to, uh, to found an actual class on it, a semester maybe. But so I just got into that and that was my reality. And I forgot about tune on, turn in, drop out and just did my thing. Uh, so that's, when I think back, for me, there was no big trauma. You know, I just kept talking about the stuff I like to talk about. Um, in terms of uh, political uh, and radical, I, um, I actually don't talk about myself as a radical. I may be contradicting my, I may have done it right in this book club several times. Uh, to, radical means one thing, root, transformation at the root. It's not extreme. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't care what you want to call it, anarchy, whatever. I just want transformation at the root. What is the root? Us, our consciousness. And so any, any technology of the self is what I call them that gets you there is fine with me, you know, be it a drug, be it Aldo Tambellini. The whole point being that, uh, however, that it has to be a world, a world you can live in. And that's, we're not there yet, but we're very close and it's very exciting. And, and when I say very close, I'm, I mean, could be 10 years, I, but you know, given the history of civilization, that's not very long. Uh, so I don't know if I'm making sense here, but you know, I would have never thought of your question about Aldo's work. And again, all I can say is that context, it's context is everything. Everything is context, that which means weave together, that word. And so you ask this, and I start quickly thinking, and I've never thought of such a question before. It is political if we say it is, period. The notions of eminence, you know, I think are kind of like, have been dismissed a long time ago. Uh, 
so the agency to have autonomy, the agency of autonomy, something I brought up early in, the, in this series, is why we spend a lot of time talking about second order systems theory. Autonomy, in my view, is the social and political issue today and henceforward forever. Maybe it, well, maybe it always has been. Self, self creation, self organization, self identifying, and all the other selves you might think of to throw in there. So here comes some ab abstract art. Uh, I could see all those uh, work being uh, shown in some neo-Nazi place. Why not? It's pretty cool work. And it would be that. Then let's say we, what I say, we quote, leave the culture and we show it in, in our, uh, our context, it becomes something else. A thing is where it is. You move it, it becomes something else. The uh, dynamism of that last one, I told, thanks for showing that. I'd forgotten uh, how cool that one is. It's really powerful. Uh, you know, it, it, it has that dynamism, it has that energy, which can be attached to or used by any context. That It could be a TV commercial. It could be anything you, you want. But I'm just trying to say, I, I can't think in terms of any kind of eminence. You know, it's just... Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I enjoy imagining that being used by neo-Nazis, just because it's kind of fun to think that, you know, <laughs> but, but I think there's, uh, there's something in there that one should think about. Yeah, Aldo is like a lifelong avowed anarchist who, you know, spent much of his childhood in Italy and passionately hated the fascists, I think would be horrified by that idea. But I, I take your point that maybe, you know, we're so used to thinking about the politics of a work being imminent to it right, being contained within its, um, its form and its content. Um, but it behooves us to think about the way in which the politics of a work is, is inevitably shaped by the context in which it is presented as well. So um, you're right, like something could be presented as a commercial, it could be presented at a fascist rally, it could be presented um, at a hippie be-in, and each of those environments will influence how we understand it. And of course, you know, this is you and me being um, very cybernetic in our thinking and trying to understand the way in which um, uh, artworks are actually systems of meaning, right? And that the the viewing, the process of viewing and the person who is doing the viewing is part of the meaning of the work and not independent from it. Um, so in other words, that the meaning is not something that exists a priori to the act of observation. So this is going back to your notion of second order cybernetics. Um, but uh, I guess in terms of the legacy of the moment then, I'm always sort of um, a little bit stuck. Um, there's a, an art historian, Thomas Crow, who um, <laughs> wrote an essay about the 60s and he has this one line that's always stuck with me. He said, the avant-garde is the research and development arm of the culture industry, right? Meaning that what always happens is the avant-garde comes out with its radical vision of the future um, with its radical form. And what inevitably happens is that the culture industry seizes upon that, cannibalizes it, makes it its own. And so um, there's, um, I think it was David James, who's a scholar of, of um, experimental film, who basically has, you know, said that what happened to the 60s and all of the stuff that you talk about in your book, Gene, all of this expanded cinema became MTV in the 80s, right? Um, I want to put aside for the question of whether or not that's a bad thing. I mean, I think uh, there's a radicality to popular culture that I want to preserve and protect and not just assume that only the avant-garde has politics and a project that we can value and agree with. But I do think there's some truth to that, that artists are not only the antenna um, of, you know, sort of perceiving um, changes in the sensorium, um, but they are also the R&D arm of the culture industry. And so, you know, like you, I've, I've have taught, um, and I think a lot about how we communicate to a younger generation of, of artists and scholars. Um, and I don't want to leave them in a place where it feels like everything is already lost, you know, where the game has already been given up. Um, just because it is the case that if you look back over time, everything that has been radical has been subsumed. 
So I, I like to say that, you know, what I learned personally from looking back at these, at what has happened over generations is that the conflict never ends, that the, the fight never ends, that we must continually be engaged in this battle, right? So we never win. Um, and the lesson I take from that though is not that we should quit because we also never lose, right? As long as we keep fighting. So um, I don't know. I it's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> fun, um, fun, but also, you know, traumatic. And we have to think about the personal costs and the privilege it is to be able to continue that fight and who is more likely to um, suffer um, it, as a consequence of waging that fight. Um, it's almost always not going to be, well, whatever, I won't get into that. But um, yeah, so I, I didn't mean to get into some like, grand theory of, of politics, but I just wanted to think about you know, given that you yourself have this political project, how we think about video art and especially this kind of abstract video art as relating to politics in a way that moves beyond pointing out that it uses technology. Because I think for a long time, we've tried to understand art and technology and its politics is about, well, do you have an ethical relationship to your tools or are you already complicit with the military industrial complex because you use a computer or what have you? And so, um, Anyway, I just wanted to keep that, sort of put that dialogue or put that question on the table. Um, so I know, Jean, you had some stuff that you wanted to say, um, uh, sort of following up on the conversations that you have already um, been having in this book club. So Barry, what do you think? Is it is now? Yeah, I mean, and maybe I'll just try and seg that stuff. Um, so I know we want to talk a little about these uh, autonomous, what's the word? I forgot the phrase. Autonomous, autonomous reality communities. Autonomous reality communities um, and a little bit of the secession from the broadcast stuff. And I guess I'll just add um, that in the sort of technology discourse, generally the politics, I, I think this concept of context is important and maybe we pick it up a, a, a apart a little bit in relation to these autonomous reality communities, because even things like, um, say, Stuart Brand and the Whole Earth Catalog, you know, you have this access to tools, and one might think that that, you know, that had a certain, um, potentially utopian, but certainly kind of leftist counterculture vision. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like, what is a firearm in America except an, a, you know, access to a tool that preserves autonomy in a certain political context? Um, so it, I think it's correct in saying that all of these things can kind of be ideas, political ideas can be reapplied and negotiated. And I think we're seeing that in terms of climate change discourse right now, where you had a certain sort of, um, maybe socialist vision for how the climate change discourse would play out, but now you're seeing a lot of sort of echo fascist kind of like block them out, um, more defensive context to that too. And so I think that that general uh, problem of like, how do we keep our politics from what we're doing being co-opted uh, towards who, uh, we, opposite politics um, is something important to talk about in relation to these autonomous reality communities as well? Um, Big question, but maybe we'll start with the autonomous reality communities and get back there. Yeah, <clears throat> that sounds fancy, right? I can't remember if I, uh, just now if I said where I got it from, did I, did I mention Maturana? Uh, we should. Probably not. No, go back into that. We may no, have mentioned no, this very early on. I think mentioned this his yeah. statement by him where I got this, uh, this phrase. He's the uh, epistemological philosopher who got his uh, philosophy from being a, a neuro, neuroscientist, uh, neurobiology. And he said this thing, we can talk about things because we create the things we talk about by talking about them. Autonomy. And so if you take that and start looking at society, it, any level of society, you find that. So if we're up there talking so-called politics, 
like voting for people and stuff like that. There are words we use. Those words are supposed to mean this and that and this and that. If we can use them autonomously, that is to say, nobody, nobody can tell us what they mean. We say what they mean. There is a, uh, oh, I want to, hold on. I want to show you two books here. I showed one already. And I don't know if you can see that. This is the classic text of what is called the sociology of knowledge. Came out uh, 60s or 70s. The, the, this is the constructivist view of social reality. So that's one. And then here's one. Interestingly, the title changed a bit. The construction of social reality. Now for me, those two books are maybe the most important books I've read in my entire intellectual life. They tell you how to put a reality together, a society together, how it's done, what actually happens at any given scale. So let's say you're, uh, let's say you're uh, selling cars. You're a car salesman. That's a world you're in. That's a reality community. There are certain realities there. They're defining what's important and what's not, what exists, what's, what's real and what's not, what's related to what's, what's good and bad regarding cars. So this notion of autonomous reality community is almost universal. You, you cannot not be in one or multiple ones or hundreds of ones at any time. So it sounds so fancy, but it's just normal daily life. If I'm gonna go over and uh, go to Latter-day Saints church, you know, that's another one. That, those sort of things is what people would say, oh, that's an autonomous reality community. Well, you know, so is your market. It's just, you got to be very, very careful to be alert to the control parameters of the discourse that is the reality that you are, you are living in. This probably sounds very uh, abstract. It's, it's the only way I can talk about it. Um, <laughs> and so, let's pause for a moment and, and just step back from that. And, uh, you know, there we were in the, in the 60s and that counterculture moment. That's very interesting. And there have been many, many books kind of speculating on how that happened, why it happened, and all the ingredients that, you know, triggered that moment. Um, but I'm going to step back from that and go back maybe to the beginning of civilization. You know, there's always been hierarchy and there's always been protest. A thousand years later, there's hierarchy and there's protest. That bores the hell out of me. And I, I've just been thinking, you know, pretty much since the 60s, what the hell happened and what is really going to change, make real change? And I come to this conclusion, you leave. <laughs> you leave. If you can, on what scale can you can? So in some minor little sense, we quote, left the culture in the 60s. Uh, some people claimed it was way bigger than what it actually was. I wrote some really, really biting articles in the free press attacking the counterculture for its pretensions. I, mean, I was living in Los Angeles, or living in hills above Sunset Boulevard, and here comes these people in there in their uh, fringe, you know, their fringe jackets and their long hair and going up and selling soap and, you know. So anyway, uh, where was I? So to me, that little taste of leaving, whatever, however small it was, was really super. That was very interesting. How did it happen? I don't know. Um, and so, hold on, got a, got a phone call here. Gonna, hold on one second. So then all co com <laughs> comes this, uh, all this new technology, uh, computer networks and all this sort of thing. And it, it seemed to me that we, we could start building social worlds, socio-cultural worlds in what is called virtual space and leave some day in some ideal day where you could really build really dense, really solid, really actual social worlds and just move into them virtually, you, you know, you would say. Um, I've only been able to talk about that in recent, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Could not talk about it back then for sure. Um, 
And I guess that's political, yeah, and I call it that. All I want to do is leave, you know, let's get simple here. But it's not, uh, but leaving is not that simple. And so it seems to me, uh, looking at this book, uh, our reading series here, um, that uh, I want to say this to, to the live audience here. I already, I already read this to, to Tina and Barry. In the introduction to EC50, in the introduction to it, three, th there's this. Three words capture the essence of the new technic, the verb to world, its inflection worlding, and the noun worlder. They do not refer to online games. More about that later. And I never got back to it. That's one of the, one of the errors in that. And so why did I say that? It just seems to me that if we're talking about the future of this art and technology, or whatever this is, expanded cinema, and if you would ask me, well, what is the Hispanic expanded cinema of, uh, cinema of today or tomorrow? It's, I would just answer as leaving. If you've got a world you, that you can go to, you can't leave without a world you can go to. So is it, so that raises this big question. Uh, to what extent is that going to be humanly possible? How, how socially dense, shall we say, or socially comprehensive, shall we say, worlds can we build and live in 24 seven? How, how, how far can we go there? Now, live in 24 seven, that's in quotes. Person has to go to work, right? So you go to the real world and you go to work. But I'm imagining some future situation, and I don't follow these technologies. I'm, I'm on a whole other world with George Kuchar, um, where to one degree or another, like for example, I'm retired now. I could move to a different world 24 seven. Most people aren't retired, can't do that. But you can, and then you can have your happy hour after work, where, you, where it's not about drinking, but it's about leaving. You put on whatever it is you're going to put on and go into that other world. To me, that is the most radical thing I can possibly imagine. Radical meaning, transformation at the root. Consciously done, using that other world as a technology of the self to radicalize yourself, to transform yourself, so that you're simply not there in that, in that psychological and cognitive and affective and emotional way. Um, to, to me, I, I've thought about this my whole life. That's the most, quote, radical thing I can possibly think. Protests, to me, are, are really sad. People have been protesting for, as I said, a thousand years. You could protest till, till the sun blows up. Nothing's going to happen. But if you leave, if a, if a significantly, if, a, if enough people, quote, and when I say leave, that's always in quotes, right? I mean, you leave when you go to a movie theater and watch that movie, you leave in some sense if the movie's, you know, whatever. Um, so, so my fascination now with these new emerging technologies, this new, the new way of thinking about really expanding cinema and living in it, to me, this is an incredibly revolutionary moment, way, way beyond anything that's gone before, early video, all that stuff, because it's about, Living elsewhere. So, Jean, yeah, I, I wasn't going to jump in again, but you just, uh, um, you know, you, have, you put so much on the table. I kind of can't help it. Um, I, I mean, from what I have seen from the artists who are actively working with these reality technologies, I mean, I, I do think that a lot of them don't see. Um, them as a way of leaving. I think in a way it's almost like the terms are reversed. It's that in our daily lives, we are, we are already left all the time. We have already left. And this is actually a way of, of um, returning. What am I trying to say? So um, I think about this formulation a lot. The, the artist Raphael Lozano Hemmer works a lot with interactive media technologies and, you know, he says all the time, um, and I'm just stealing this from him, you know, and I'm paraphrasing that, that so much of this kind of technology 
psychology is oneric, right? It's about immersing yourself in this dream world. And he says, I don't want you to dream. You're already dreaming. I want you to wake up. And I wonder if to sort of just invert the terms a little bit that, that what these technologies can do now for, um, for us today is to help us sort of wake up to certain realities that we don't normally see. So yes. I'm thinking of artists like, you know, like um, just to give one example, um, Alfredo Salazar Caro, who's using um, virtual reality to tell the story of migrants who are traveling through Latin America to the U.S. Um, <laughs> right, so, so it's Tina. Tina I, I understand totally what you're saying. I can't uh, resist from some jump, jumping on this now, because you, you, it's my fault if people don't understand what I mean by I leap. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking bit. about going into some fancy world. I'm not talking about going into you know playing games. Okay. So let's imagine this fellow you just talked about. I don't know who he is, I, and that sounds cool to me. Whatever he's doing. Anything that could bring the system down is fine with me. So what does leave mean? Okay, let's say I'm in this quote, quote, other world. Forget what it is like. It's another world. And we're using artificial intelligence at a very advanced stage, AR, XR, all that stuff. So I'm in this world, and uh, there's a tree over there. And that tree is talking to me. And, it, and that tree is telling me what that fellow you just mentioned does in life. So all around me, objects, people are absolutely as counter as you could possibly get to the world in which we now occupy. That's what I call leaving. Well, it would have to be absolute radical politics or you haven't left. You know, again, not extreme, root, consciousness, awareness, knowledge. And so I'm getting the sense that these technologies that are coming could be used to build worlds like that whose every dimension are exactly counter to the discourse we call America. That's mm -hmm. what I mean by leave. I don't mean, you know, being a kid playing games. Although, again, we should bracket games actually now are quite radical too, <laughs> but, um, or can be quite radical too. Um, okay, but that, that helps a lot actually when you say leave, because I mean, thinking back to this moment in the 60s and the rhetoric of, um, you know, dropping out, um, and you, you're talking about, you know, these kids wearing fringe and selling soap and stuff. Um, yeah, it's just good to understand what you mean by leaving, that it's not about checking out, because you mentioned going to the movies, and so it seemed like you were talking about... Yeah, I, okay. yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. And let me just respond to that. You said uh, some games are radical. Again, my, my thinking, on it, <laughs> the way I think about it is, the, the, yes, there are utterances that you could call radical. That's what they're labeled. So this is a radical utterance. The hell with capitalism. That's radical. And I imagine, I imagine, you know, those are in games. I don't know. I've never seen a game. But to me, I'm not interested in any radicalness other than a world you can live in as much as possible. Live in it, not go play a game or watch it but be surrounded by a reality that is exactly counter to the one we live in politically. I'm not talking about, you know, flying animals and stuff. I'm only talking about how you think of the world, how you construct yourself, what's that sort of thing. That's all ever, that's all I ever think about in terms of uses of these technologies. So for example, when you say, well, uh, Aldo's work is political. Well, is as we say so. Mm -hmm. If it's part of a world I want to build, and <clears throat> here's all those video going over here, and here over here is an anarchist talking to me, and the anarchist says, hey, Aldo's really cool. You know, I like that. That's nice. And I would call that kind of situation, I would have left something that that world is not. I wonder if part of what we're talking about, sorry, and I feel like we've, we've completely digressed because we were supposed to get to some other stuff that you were gonna do maybe, and then there's obviously the audience too, but um, 
I wonder if we're talking about community building in a way, which is something that I was thinking about a lot while I was rereading Expanded Cinema, um, just thinking about the kinds of community that you have had and benefited from and which produced this book. I mean, you just talking about in, in the new introduction, staying up all night and talking to Sherry Rabinowitz and Kit Galloway and the conversations that you would have as housemates. I mean, community has been really um, profound in how we think about the history of the avant-garde and um, in the writing of histories, I mean, there's always that moment when you're studying a new movement and you realize like, oh, these people were all sleeping with each other and or were best friends or, you know. Um, so thinking about what community looks like with these new technologies, like when you talk about living in a world that's a rejection of the one that we currently live in, right? I mean, it seems like the current society in which we live, it's predicated upon the atomization of the individual, right? The breaking up of the social contract, um, whether it's through, and I know you said you don't do social media and you don't really know much, you know, other than not liking, that's fine. Um, but like um, the way that big data works is precisely about the atomization of the individual, the way that the, the feed works, right? Is all about creating a very individual flows of information um, and bubbles of information. And so I wonder if, the antidote to all of that is about community building. And I just want to call out a comment that appeared um, in the, the chat from Eric Drayson, which I think is a really salient one, which is that um, we, we have to be careful when we talk about sort of like dropping out that, you know, we're not creating a vacuum that will then be filled by um, the free market, for example, right? That it's, or when we drop out, that we don't drop out alone um yeah. that we have to drop out together yeah and what does that look like and so how will these technologies actually allow us to to envision a new communitarian kind of politics yeah i, I hear you and uh, i'm not surprised to hear that because i come okay um i am not talking about dropping out <laughs> sorry sorry okay fair no no i'm not not i'm not directing that at you i'm directing at the whole world who can't think beyond those narrow kinds of thoughts dropping out. Um, and you brought up uh, something else that's really important. I'm not putting forward some fantasy image of a world that's all so warm and fuzzy and we're all together and we're all busy sending and receiving love notes and all this stuff. I think what's ahead of us is incredible chaos. I'm not sure we'll get through it. So when I say secession from the broadcast, well, look at the world today. Do you actually imagine this world coming together in any significant way? Give me a break. So when I talk about leaving and all this stuff, I'm really talking about something that's very dangerous, but that I don't see any way around. I don't see anything on the horizon that, that even gives me the slightest uh, reason to think that we're going to have community. Yes, an autonomous reality community, that the, that word is in there, right? But there's going to be thousands of them. We're looking at atomization. Atomization has, has only started, in my view, because if you follow this logic of what I'm talking about, it only takes you there to, to the atomization. I, I can't, I don't know how else, where else you would go. So it's extremely contradictory and problematic but it's the path that I see that we're on. Maybe I'm blind. Maybe there's this lovely rose path to happiness for everybody. Well, you've been very good at seeing what's around the corner for a very, very long time. I mean, just reading, you know, rereading Expanded Cinema and specifically this chapter, TV as a creative medium, all of the predictions that you, you know, that you had or that you were relaying in your text about how video technologies would change society in the future. I mean, it took decades, but we're there. Everything, you know, feels like it more or less came true. So um, um, I'm paying attention, your prognostication. Okay. Uh, you mentioned Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinowitz, and earlier I mentioned I had an anecdote about Howard Wise, so I'd like to share that with you. Yes, <laughs> um, and, and also to, to say this, in, if you read the introduction, uh, I talk about, they did this thing called Electronic Cafe, and then they did another thing called Electronic Cafe International, make it in, get out of the museum and just make it the world, the life world. And uh, 
I've got a 600 page biography of their life, which is now in the hands of uh, Michael Connor, because I'm never gonna finish that book. And he's, as we speak, I've, I've been talking to him recently, he's gonna try to raise money to hire a professional editor to finish that book. And the world is gonna be astounded, I assure you. Nothing like what, that, what they did, that story of Electronic Cafe International is known. But let's get back to Howard Wise. Kid and, Cherry, Kid and Cherry met in Paris, whenever it was. And uh, they were, in a sense, searching for something in their lives. They didn't have meaning in their lives. But Kid had, had this vision of, of a communication, a whole kind of other people's communication revolution kind of thing. He inspired her. So anyway, they came to America because NASA was opening up, NASA was open to uh, pu uh, public, public uh, experiments on their satellites. If you were public, you could propose something. Hey, let's do this with the satellite. Kid and Sherry had a very, very uh, vivid and powerful image of what was possible. But they were literally penniless. They arrived in New York, like, you know, like the old stories of penniless people. And they heard about this guy, Howard Wise. So they go to him, sit, he, and Howard, like he always was, oh, welcome, come in, sit down here. What, what, tell me about yourself, you know, this kind of thing. And they told him their ideas. He gave him, he wrote a check for $1,000 on the spot. They, they couldn't even pay their hotel bill. And just on their word for it, just on how they expressed their passion, he, he was right there, I'm behind you. So I just want to give that, uh, that's who the guy was. And I hope that someday, some, maybe there are already writings, you know, about Howard Wise. He was an important figure, made a lot of things happen. And just on that, back in Paris, there's another very, very important figure, Jack Moore, who's almost unknown in, in this country, in video history, a major guy, and which my book on, uh, on Electronic Cafe International goes, there's like a hundred pages that include Jack Moore. So I just want to throw that in there too. So anyway, that was my little story about Howard. Well, I love it. Um, I, I collect stories about Howard Wise. I'm probably the only person who has looked at the entirety of the Howard Wise archives at Harvard and the Smithsonian. Um, and I just saw so many receipts for just rent checks that he would cut to artists who were in his stable. I mean, really, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. It's not the first story I've heard like, um, uh, like that about Howard. And to, to make that sort of relevant to the contemporary moment, I think that what we're seeing now with this coronavirus crisis is that at least in America, the way that our culture industry works, it's not set up for the benefit of artists. I mean, it hasn't ever been. Um, just looking at something like artist resale rights, for example, and I think that there's a lot of conversation now thinking about how we can imagine a new art world on the other side of this crisis that would better serve um, artists. And thinking about somebody like Howard Wise, who's a dealer who um, really believed in the artists that he um, supported, couldn't sell them very much, um, but wrote them checks to cover their rent. Um, so thinking about what a kind of patronage system would look like. And I don't think it should be based on the largesse of private individuals because that's precarious and capitalistic, but um, you know, thinking about really putting the emphasis on like paying rent for artists, um, what, what that might look like, how that's gonna work um, rather than you know, trafficking in objects. So, which has obviously been a problem for the past 50 years for artists who make media art. And the market now is trying to solve that in certain ways that are more or less elegant, but um, I'm very excited that there are many people, some of whom I think are on this call, um, who are trying to rethink a new art world economy. For yeah. The art. yeah, and that brings in uh, the notion of curation, curatorial projects. Uh, and I, I, believe me, I, I don't pretend to be anywhere near a sophisticated thinker on this. Um, so it seems to me you can curate shows, right? What if you, can you curate worlds? And if you did, is that a good thing or a bad thing? In other words, 
who is the Clement Greenberg of virtual reality? You know, who, uh, it seems to me, if we're gonna build these alternative worlds that are truly, truly alternative, that is opposite, politically hardcore opposite, uh, well, who's gonna guide that? You, know, you got this problem, that this age old, centuries old problem of leaders and followers and hierarchical things, you know, all that stuff. But it, but it seems to me that there, there will be brilliant, I'm putting this in quotes, brilliant curators who have visions of worlds, very powerful. And again, don't think of me as some hippie who wants to drop out. <laughs> so we, let's get past that, okay? So, uh, but to me, that, that, that's, that's a fascinating question to me. How, we're talking about building worlds. Well, you know, who's got the blueprint? What conversation did these worlds come out of? Well, maybe so. Again, if you're talking about some, uh, let's talk about the Trump, the Trump uh, fringe today. They are not alternative in any way. They're solid Americans. But you know, if they want to build a world, well, who's going to do it? You know, all this stuff that fascinates the hell out of me. I have no doubt at all that these worlds are coming up, and it's going to be utter chaos. Uh, yeah. The earth that they create is going to be, we are not going to have, not going to know how to deal with it. So this is just, these, are, these, are, these are just unanswerable questions to me. I don't, uh, I, I just want to, my message to the world is, folks, we're facing something here that we, we don't know what it is. We never have a, any opportunity to even ask these questions. And therefore, they're the most important questions to be asked. I was going to say, speaking of chaos, let's go to the uh, the chat and see if anyone has any questions. But since you just put questions on the table, um, we got one on here. Let me see. Uh, Av, I wonder if the physical phenomenon of chaos is useful to think through the worlding, think through worlding. It has often been maligned as something to fear, and I feel that chaos is a constructive as well as destructive force, and seems to be connection between a lot of the works that expanded cinema references artists. Um, Artists creating systems that are chaotic and that affect the nervous system and disrupt it, but also find new patterns and new rhythms, which were intended to becoming the most exciting aspect of the work. Is this the vision of worlding? I mean, I think one thing interesting about that is um, this sort of coronavirus situation, which is in a lot of the ways has just kind of shaken the edges sketch a little bit, but also kind of put us all on a time machine where we, in the course of a few weeks, went five years in the future, at least, um, in terms of this video connection, in terms of sort of like a lot of the ways funding models were, it, there's a lot of ways in which this kind of just has, has forced us to confront a lot of um, the chaos as it can force us to confront a lot of the systems we have in place. And I think art is a lot of that as well. Um. Yeah, uh, <laughs> when I use the word chaos, uh, maybe I shouldn't have used that word because I, I know uh, other realms in, in which I think. polarization is what I meant. The polarization that we see today, I see it not only not ending, but getting a way, way, way more polarized, way more. That's what I meant by chaos. I'm not very interested in there's this whole discourse in in the art world where you, you you invoke all these things about from science you know and chaos theory and all that stuff it's fine it never spoke to me in any compelling way but so i don't have any response to to that particular question as i understand it hey if it works for you go for it make art chaotic art there we go we got one more gustavo has a question uh, how does semiotics as a tool relate to this paradigm of worlding? I have no idea. <laughs> semiotics. Yeah. The study um, of meaning, right? Oh, there's, an there's another word that associates this guy, these guys. Uh, they have a word. They use a certain phrase for what I mean by autonomous reality communities, and they talk about finite provinces of meaning, 
finite provinces of meaning. Well, could that be your church? Could that be your, your college? Could be your market? Yeah. I mean, the interesting, you know, I get the whole, the, the, the sort of problem in the autonomous, uh, potential problem in the autonomous reality communities to me. Um, and I understand that people have worldviews that already exist, so this isn't a new thing. But, you know, I understand the whole dropping out of the hegemonic American culture, sort of, at, I'm sorry to use dropping out again, I don't want to argue about that. <laughs> um, just bad phrasing. But I understand seceding from the hegemonic American culture aspect of it, but the danger there is um, uh, getting trapped in your own bubble and not having these sort of, not being able to see what's going on in other people's worlds that might um, behoove you to understand portions of their experiences and thus I'm glad build a greater collective world. You know, this kind of, there's a danger in this sort of like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you brought that up because it kind of totally baffles me when people talk about that. Um, oh, we're, uh, there's, there's a, a word they use for it these days uh, where you get into your little group, you know, and you don't see anything else. You, you're, you're only, and, you, and they speak very critically about uh, seeking out those with whom you agree and all that stuff. Well, silos, silos, thank you. Um, when I, when I started hearing that, I thought, what? Uh, I, I think they're assuming a certain kind of person. Number one, probably not very well educated, not very curious. And you might say to me, well, yeah, yeah, that's most people. Well, so if I imagine myself in one of these autonomous reality communities, I don't even imagine a community necessarily. A world, it's just a world, a world full of people that feed me, that have what I want in terms of thoughts. Does that mean that I forgot what the rest of the world is like? Does that mean that I don't know what the rest of the world believes, which is the very reason I want to leave it? So, I, so that, that baffles me, uh, Barry. I don't, I don't quite get this huge fear of that sort of thing. Uh, yes, there is polarization, but does polarization mean that I don't understand you, where you're coming from? I think sometimes it does, um, because I think one of the things that we've lived through now are um, uh, the social media thing has been widely impactful on this, because what uh, there was a trajectory that happened, I know we're getting to the bottom of the hour and I'm about ready to open up a whole like, another hour of discussion but just just bring it to it right just briefly um i think tina has to get back to mother's day here in a second um my mother's in the cloud um <laughs> we had an open web and open internet that allowed a lot of these sorts of um I think pockets of autonomy to happen in like knowledge space, noosphere space. And what ended up happening with a lot of these social media platforms driven by AI and sort of big data and all this stuff was that everything got recollapsed into these news feeds where people did only see content that they thought was um, autonomous to them and it increased the polarization instead of decreased it because they just didn't have the information like literally the information that was getting to them was being controlled in a way where they couldn't uh understand the perspectives of the other side and that caused um extremism as opposed to radicalism maybe yeah you know what i've been uh, uh been made aware of doing this book club but not only that other uh, the thing with um, Rhizome, with the, uh, the uh, release party, those were the, literally, that with Michael and this with you guys are the first time in my entire life that I've ever even given five seconds of thought to social media. I've seen it like about three minutes one time. 
And mm-hmm. it was obvious to me, it was total chaos and didn't want to be there. However, I'm learning that everybody else is there and this is going to be a communication problem be- between me and the world. <laughs> Because I have no idea what their life is like, people who do social media. Um, and, but let me just, do I, uh, do I know about how the, I'm going to call them Trump fringe, how they think? Yes, I do. I listen to them. Do you not listen to people? You know, I mean, how do you live in the world? So, of course, I know what these people think. And I've lived a long time, you know? I've had some experience. I know, I think I know why people think the way they think. And it's not simple, it's very complicated. I think at the bottom, all, everybody has a very good soul. But in this world, you, you know, there's a meat grinder out there. So I'm pretty confident. And if I think I don't know how someone thinks, and there's a reason for me to think about them, I will try right away to figure out how they think. And I assume everyone does, but apparently they don't. And that's why all, all this uh, fuss about siloing and all that. I'm, I'm just shocked, you know. Mm. On the other hand, aren't I contradicting myself now? <laughs> why should I be shocked? I don't know. It's interesting. All right. I love you, Barry. You've been really great. Well, thanks. Love you too, and I think do you want to, do you want to tell everybody this is your last one again now? <laughs> the man is not to be believed, but he's saying it again. We'll I'm see. Pay no it's attention been... to the man behind the Zoom chat. Tina, anything <laughs> else before we? You want to have any thoughts to? Well, I want to thank Tina. Yeah. I really appreciate your the things you've said, Tina. I, I understand what you're I understand what you're saying. Take it seriously. Uh, that's great because half the time I don't understand what I'm saying. So at least one of us does. <laughs> yeah, I could join you there too. <laughs> no, I mean, um, you know, I just think I speak on behalf of um, a lot of people who have been tuning into these conversations just to say that, you know, my life would be different without expanded cinema. So thank you so much for writing it. And thank you so much. Thank for Thank you. I, I want to say sincerely, thank you for saying that. All this stuff that's come up, you know, EC50, and I'm getting all, all things like you just said, it's, it, it has been very touching to me, deeply. Very, it's, it's made, you know, I'm 77, and <laughs> it's made my life quite full to have this appreciation. And I just want everybody to know, thanks a lot. Love you all. All right, everybody call your mother. Um, <laughs> and that concludes... The, well, yeah. Sorry, sorry, just uh, one oh. last thing. Uh, nationalbailout.org, um, if you uh, have any time today and if you have the ability, if you could donate some money to get some moms out on bail who are currently in jail, that would be fantastic. So they could be reunited with their families ASAP. So nationalbailout.org. Nationalbailout.org. To go to yep, to get All moms right. out, of, out on bail. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.